So yes, um, I'm an architect based in Lewis and I uh, have my own practice there. I'm also a senior lecturer at the University of Brighton Department of Architecture. Been there since 1994. And uh, my practice is called BBM Sustainable Design. And we were lucky enough in 1993 to win a competition to design what was called the House of the Future. And it was an environmentally friendly House of the Future. We built it in 94, started teaching as well. And since then, we've just been immersed in environmentally friendly things. So we're very lucky, we've had a very unusual experience, but we worked on all sorts of different scales of things. So if you got us 12 years ago, we were working on the Grange Millennium Village, big things, and we were visioning big things, and what would sustainable development be, and what were sustainable communities, all that sort of stuff. <coughs> Meanwhile, back in Lewis, we were doing loft conversions, you know, so it was a bit strange. But um, I'm gonna to talk to you initially about sort of certain things that influence me. I've got weird things, I've got loads of slides, I'm gonna have to do that loads. But I do start with this, because in my world of architecture, most architects want to do this sort of stuff. So this is the Bertone Stadium. Um, I'll use the uh, Olymp new Olympic Stadium as an example soon. But this is even better, because this was the Chinese, being the, the ancient the Egyptians for a bit. Millions of pounds of resource, quite a few hundred people dying, all the steel that you wanted if you were in Europe, was going that way. Couldn't, in, in 2006, 2007, we were pre-ordering steel before we went on site, before we'd chosen a contractor even, because the price of steel was going up monthly. So resources is a huge, huge thing. The consequence of these things, do, does anyone really care? That's another sort of building next door to it. Look at that. This is not all your project, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I clear, don't give a toss, and uh, that was my project. No, this, the, 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 the Bird's Nest Stadium was by Herzog and Lamoran, who apparently, at the moment, are probably the most prolific uh, Swiss architects in the world, going around the world building these sorts of things. But this is the number one person at the moment, Graham Courthouse, there's an exhibition of his work at the Barbican at the moment. Uh, his practice is called OMA, and that's the new CCTV building in Beijing. Huge, great, it's a scary thing, deliberately so, because he's a bit of a wit. And that next, I said wit, <laughs> next door is a hotel also designed by Rem. Now, one thing I would say to my architecture students and anybody, if you have a building that you build and open it up, don't open it up with a firework. And I say that on November the 5th. That building burnt down the day it was opened, last <gasps> January. The, uh, the site agent is in prison now. And uh, Rem's got a new job, he's got to rebuild it. So. Anyway, so these are the sort of things we like to normally get preoccupied, but at what cost? I don't want to upset you guys too much, but resources, people. That's an open co copper mine anywhere. Ugh. There's one ethically sound copper mine. You try building without using copper, and these people. This is what we do to our buildings, our newly built buildings really, buildings that are 20, 30, maybe 40 years old. We treasure the old ones, anything post-war in this country we don't like very much, tend to crunch it up and put it into holes in the ground. We've got to start loving these things because we've got a big job. They mustn't end up there. And we have only one planet, not three. And I, I have only, I've sort of come into two talks today, and maybe at the wrong moment, but all I've heard is people talking about the cost of stuff. I know it's the recession, etc., and things we're all thinking about how to make our pounds go further. But timber isn't the way. What we've got to do is whatever we've got is to reduce the consumption of it. Timber is in making the CO2 content of the atmosphere just as bad as it ever was, in fact, worse. I don't believe in the carbon cycle. I don't believe that that's in, because that wouldn't know that there is a carbon sink you can burn. Because what all people are doing is not changing their lifestyles at all, just swapping oil for timber, carrying on as they were, a lot of people. And uh, there's a rush to burn things at the moment, and unfortunately, we're encouraged to do it as well. So um, it's very difficult to remember that it's only one planet, not three, and are we all aware of one planet living? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah, everybody. Okay. The well, reason I say one planet, not three, is because in this room, we probably all exist as three and a half, four planet societies going up at the moment. And um, that means that everybody in the world, all seven billion of us now, existed like we do, we'd need four planets of stuff. So we're greedy. We're consuming future generation stuff, other people's stuff as well. The ecological footprint, as it's called, the negative burden of us as an individual, or all of us as a community, 
on the planet is huge. And it's the air we breathe, the stuff we burn, the stuff we mine. London, if that was a sustainable city, it would need the rest of the UK to be its resource. So no more cities, no Newcastle, no Birmingham, no Edinburgh. You'd need all that land for woodlands, ironworks, poppies, tulips, whatever, food. So we've got to reduce by three quarters the stuff we consume, and that's the big deal. And we can ignore it at the moment if we want, because times is hard. Back to architecture. I won't dwell too much on this, because I haven't got too long to speak. But for me, these, this is one of the most inspirational buildings in the world. It's a church. I'm not Christian, but it's in Alabama, and it costs fifteen thousand dollars to build. And how on earth did they build a building for fifteen thousand dollars, eight thousand pounds? Because it's made out of other people's rubbish. So there's a, there's a school of architecture in Alabama called Rural Studio, and they're also a practice. And uh, this glass screen here is made out of 85 Chevrolet car windscreens. <laughs> the only stuff that was the $15,000 worth of skinny steel bits, rammed earth walls with a bit of cement in them, salvaged timber, salvaged everything else. It's a student, uh, it's a close up of a student, but a bit of student accommodation at Rural Studio, number plates, aluminium number plates instead of shingles. <laughs> Can anyone guess what that wall's made of? It's load bearing. Tiles? Um, telephone directories. Who said tiles? Carpet tiles. 36,000 unfashionably striped brand new carpet tiles found, found at a landfill site. <laughs> and they make load bearing walls out of them, so they stack them up flat. They got, they're made out of plastic and maybe rubber, probably all plastic, probably all polypropylene. Go into landfill, uh, once it's in the ground, plastic's not going to do anything, it's in the air forever. So they clamp it down at the top with a nice big beam, bolt it together, and they make a bonkers house. I mean, that is actually the bedroom. <laughs> the people that live in that house, there's a family of about 15, lived in a blacked out railway carriage before that. That's the other agenda going on, by the way. They build these things for disenfranchised people in Alabama. So recycling's the big deal, reducing is the big deal. We do it at the University of Brighton with our students. They learn from Rural Studio. We're doing it with a project that's going to be built in the spring, which is something I did with um, Grand Design's Kevin McLeod, which was called the house that Kevin built. We built the first prefabricated house made entirely out of replenishable, compostable material. Apart from the glass. And uh, that's being rebuilt a bit differently down in Brighton at the moment. So we started that in May. It inspired students for the first time this year to build their own pavilion. And they're digging a hole there to make, make a round chalk wall, which is literally chalk from the building site just above here. This is right next to the dome in Brighton. This is the Faculty of Art. And just near it is a hundred million pound new American Express building. The waste off that site you could build a village with. So they were very happy to give us some of their waste. The afternoon after we met them, we got a phone call saying, We've got 200 sheets of ply, where do you want them? And we're like, oh, it's only February, this thing needs to be up in May. The resources that are being burnt and going to landfill are amazing. Interesting so, idea for our, uh, our planned uh, um, community centre in the village. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We've got students inventing construction systems made out of rubbish at the moment for the house that Kevin built. They did a straw bale workshop that got them a straw bale wall. They made a wall out of chalk. There it is, it's gorgeous. And that is the pavilion, made out of waste from, you just see it above there, no you can't, but there's a big crane in that building. So these things can be done. And we all know that we need to reduce before we reuse, before we recycle. But there's also this other thing we need to think of, whether it's in our own houses or whatever, is we need to design for demolition. So one day, the bits that you've used can perhaps be reused. Again, but the big challenge we've got is that we have got to reduce our CO2 emissions. Still by 80% by 2050 or 60% by 2020, whatever you want to do. But you're going to have to do that to buildings like this. You're going to have to do it to 80% of the buildings that we can see now. Because even though I say we demolish buildings, it's only the recently built stuff we tend to demolish. Stuff we're used to, we treasure, we list. The 
hauling buildings are listed, hauling buildings are listed. And these are our eco towns. So I don't know if you've ever heard of eco towns. There's an eco town movement. There's still one or two perhaps being built. The good ones, are luckily, are being built, which are the ones that are part of existing communities. We do not need new eco towns. They're not going to teach us anything. Apart from these things, are still not working. They're not working as sustainable cities. What we've got to do to those is what we've really got to tackle. How do you turn that into a learning building? Well, I've got ideas about that one. It's one of my favourite buildings in London. How do you turn that into a low energy building? These are the real questions that have got to preoccupy us. I live there. How do you turn that? Lewis High Street. How do you turn that into a low carbon high street? It's all listed. Well, actually, if you really understand your listing and what that is, you're looking at a medieval high street which has got uh, a Tudor, uh, Georgian, Victorian, Edwardian facades just slapped on the front of it. I've worked on some of these buildings, the walls are that thick because they've got so many layers. Some of them are due, unfortunately, the 21st century solution. They're going to have to. It may not end up looking the same, we don't know. But we've got difficult questions to answer. Some projects are accidentally green. This is just a, a sort of flash developers from Manchester called Urban Splash, who do things around the, the UK. And they actually bought these two terraces. There's a, Imagine two lots of 15 terrace houses, back to back. They actually bought them and didn't knock them down. So this is a scheme that's accidentally green. There's no green agenda here at all. They cut, they cut the guts out of these buildings. They put an apartment downstairs and a duplex upstairs. Raised the garden, which actually gave it a better solar aspect. The big deal is they didn't demolish the houses. They're the same brick walls, brick party walls. They put a garage underneath the garden with the four by fours. <laughs> but accidentally green, right, deliberately green but weird. Paris is a 1960s warehouse, it's now a fashion school, and it wasn't demolished. That was a big deal. They reused the stuff that was useful, which was a heavyweight concrete thermal mass in the frame. And then they put this weird green thing on top of it, but that's got your solar thermal, your solar PV, your green roof. And they didn't throw the original building away, that's the big deal. Right, I'll talk about something that's a bit more relevant to us. In 2008, I think it was, the, the uh, Technology Strategies Board, who the central government funded, uh, had this Retrofit the Future initiative. And this was a series of feasibility studies, we did three of them, looking at typical, ordinary English houses. And uh, looking at how you could reduce the carbon emissions from these houses by 80%. What did you have to do? So quite a single objective. We had to get the CO2 emissions down from 350 or 400 kilograms per meter square per annum down to 17. And that was the only objective. And I'm saying that because you then, you then end up with a certain sort of solution if you just got that tunnel vision, which I don't agree with, but it's interesting as a study. One out of our three feasibility studies was actually selected to be to go on site and I'm really happy because every scheme had the same budget depending on what size it was and we had this big Victorian house with six bed sits in it with two peers housing uh, association and uh, the other projects by the way that had the same budget were sort of end of terrace three bedroom house in Dartford I mean 150 grand standard <laughs> you just will be what's that going to tell you apart from it's unsustainable so this is, works out about £23,000 an apartment. And what we did, that's a plan of the typical Victorian house really, but this one and our one. This is the listed facade, and this dark stuff is insulation. So on the listed facade, we had to replace timber windows with timber windows that were sliding slash double glazed, same size glazing bars as existing, and then put the insulation on the inside. You see that lapse over with this insulation on the outside. The side walls and the rear walls, we could do treble glazed windows and insulation on the outside, which we then re-rendered on the, onto the insulation. What did you use for insulation? We used Kings, a Kingspan petroleum-based nasty product. <laughs> but they've got a great sustainability statement, so they must be all right. <laughs> anyway, here it is, all shiny. We, we don't normally use this stuff, that's why I'm being a bit like this about it, but it got us for the budget. 
got us the target. So there's the insulation going on the inside. Now the big deal to get buildings performing really well is to seal them. And the people investing in this product, sticky tape that doesn't, that can stick to anything, are the people that are going to make a lot of money over the next few years. And uh, so you s new windows, these are the treble glazed windows, and this is the inside, and this is us sealing them. But we had to strip away the old plasterboard and window board. And what they didn't tell you is that this stuff doesn't stick to brickwork, so we had to do a little bit of plastering. These are the sort of things you learn when you do the job. The other thing is there's a lot of this sort of stuff, polyurethane, gunge, foam, to fill in every gap. Lots of insulation in the ceiling, and also, before you put the insulation in, this vapor control layer, again, to stop any air leakage. So you make a sort of breathable bubble. Then we whack on insulation on the outside. So that's the existing walls back there, lead tray, two layers of insulation. That's the outside? That's the outside. So how thick is that? 100, 100 mil. Four inches. Yeah, it is going on everything. Interestingly, we got to our target of 17 kilograms per meter square per annum without PV. We didn't touch the roof. We put a couple of solar thermal panels on the roof. That boiler is that big. That's one boiler for six apartments. That's the solar store for that. The solar aspect of it is not a big deal. That's before and after. So, it is interesting. The only difference is actually that this has got thicker. This elevation has been insulated on the back, inside. But really, the house is just growing four inches on all sides. And you can get this range of system that sticks to Kingspan. So we did that. Caroline Lucas opened it with us. There she is in the middle. Well done, Caroline. <laughs> and, but this is for me a big question. You've surrounded this building, this old building, not that old, 130 years old, in something that doesn't breathe. It's in petroleum products. Straw bales. Sorry? What about straw bales? Well, you, it's size. The problem that, is. That's the problem. So the problem is, what do you do? And I've got another case study to show you. But this one has met its air tightness change. Yeah, that's a, that's a, something that cut, they come along and they test how many, how leaky, leaky or not. So we've done very well there, and there's all the sort of figures, which I won't go into, but it does do the job. It's being monitored at the moment. Interestingly, we've got this thermal imaging. So it's taking about April when it's not, it's not, it doesn't work so well in, in April. You get a bit warm. But interestingly, this is our building. Show me not leaking very much, but the red colour show that the travel lodge behind is leaking big time. The other thing that's strange though is that, and it might not be really leaking, we've got to do this again soon, is that shows that where the, at the eaves, where the roof hits the wall, there's a bit of leakage as well in terms of energy. But with, that might not be true, it might, that might be a bit of soap again. So this is how we normally do it. How long have I got? Five. Okay, this is how we normally do it. That's a 1960s building in Wright, which is near Lewis. We took off the existing hanging tiles and sold them. We actually free cycled and sold the double glazed PV units. We barely used the skip. This skip's here because we demolished the porch. We didn't have a skip after that. We had clients who really salvaged everything. We then used 140 millimeters of timber fiber insulation, which does breathe. It's a waste product, it's from Germany at the moment. If we planted more woodlands and generated them up the market, we have working woodlands that supply us with this. We do have working woodlands that supply us with this, which is chestnut, sweet chestnut. And we use that on a lot of our products, and that's regenerating Sussex woodlands at the moment. So that's the building with timber insulation on it. Then a breather paper that has to go on the outside of a builder paper, also made out of waste paper and waste plastic. And that's it finished. The render downstairs is lime onto timber fibre board, and that's a rain screen on timber fibre board. Inside, we reused the maple floor, the 1960s maple floor, and made kitchen units out of it. We put down a new low carbon concrete screed with underfloor heating in it, polished the screed, it's gorgeous. 
gives you your thermal mass, so you don't overheat. Read beds a lot. And that's what it was like before. Mm -hmm. And just quickly, this is my own house in Lewis that Mike's been to. This cost £140,000 to build. My bills at the moment, oh, and I've got an edible garden thing. <laughs> my bills at the moment are gas 300, it's doubled. I love my bills at the moment. You've used 20% less gas than last year this time. Your bill is 50% more. That's what we can do. Well, that's great. That's good energy for you. And I, I, you know, that, good. Anyway, so that's my bills. I've got a guy, a friend of mine walks past me every day. Poor thing is on benefits. That's his, well, I don't know, six week bill. He's having to find hundreds a week. And uh, he's on benefits. So, the whole green thing mustn't just be for people who can afford it. This was a, my own house. Just a timber frame building with a heavyweight concrete screed. Thermal mass keeps you cool in the summer, warm in winter. Sorry, this screed, which is it before, obviously before it's finished, that screed during the winter keeps us warm. The first winter we were in the house, we didn't realise that our underfloor heating system wasn't speaking to the gas boiler. We survived and kept warm because the, wa the walls were quite well insulated. Only, a hun only six inches of lamb's wool. But the solar gain that was being absorbed here and get radiated out when the temperatures go down at night time was keeping us warm. And it was only in February, the first thing we were there, when we got cold because it was no sun for a week and cold. And then we realised that floor feels like a prison cell. <laughs> Not that I know what that feels like. <laughs> so that was what we came into our English, English timber non toxic treatment. Borax treatment. Uh, sweet chestnut from Sussex Woodlands. Clay plaster. We've reduced the amount of finishes and layers on the building, so you use clay plaster, it absorbs airborne toxins, reduces sick building syndrome, which is a problem with a lot of well sealed new buildings. It's a lovely finish. It costs more than plaster, but not more than part plaster and paint. <laughs> This is a German product from a company called Tintab in, in New Haven. It's an oak block board made, stuck together with uh, from had free glue. It's all out there, and what we need is good ideas. And that's what we need collectively and as individuals. This is a brilliant idea because it's one of my favorite architects, Peter, Peter Zumter. I don't know if anyone went to the Serpentine Gallery this year and saw the extension. They do a, they do a pavilion every year, a different one, and he did the one this year which is beautiful, but this was a lot better. And uh, it was just a stack of timber. And you could go in this building and it, they performed there, they did had banquets there and stuff. But it's a, the thing I would say, put it in the context of what sort of expo, what happens with normal expo pavilions. People, countries spend millions on them, they're up for three months, they get thrown away. This one, when it was time to finish, they unscrewed this and you got a pile of timber. They sold off and gave away the timber to people that needed timber. That's the sort of thing we need. Thank you. That's great. No, no, no. <laughs> well, um, one question. Can I have a quick question? A quick question. There's always a quick answer. Simple, simple <laughs> Where do we find out about getting that, uh, uh, a lot of these products? Because that is the greatest problem. Research and research and research and now finding them. You guys, of course, in the architectural industry. Very much with more aware than you know, so, and with a 500 year old uh, ancient building, which is just I mean, Yeah, um, there's something called the Association of Environment Conscious Builders. I think the easiest thing is to just take my card and I'll, I'll point you in the direction. Brilliant. Thank you very much. These contacts. But it, we, like, that's why I said we've been in a rarefied environment. We won about six or seven design competitions of, over the years, and we're able to do unusual things and test things. And um, that, so we've got quite a lot of knowledge around this. But the big thing, I'm about, about to write a book about my house because I've lived in it for eight years and I can reflect on what works and what doesn't. But the big thing is it's not expensive. And um, at the moment all we're thinking of is this is all going to cost loads of money. Some of it will, but you know, you don't have to throw lots of money at lots of technology. But we have got to learn how to reduce stuff. And not just think, oh, if I buy into a timber, I can keep the thermostat up as high as it was before, because it's timber. Any other questions? Are there any plans for anything like 
in Forest Hill to, to, to have these sort of houses built or I don't know who sort of... Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. No one's approached me. But um, we do, we're doing things in Brighton. But yeah, that's, Brighton's difficult. You know, Brighton's got a sustainability network and all that sort of stuff. Green Architecture Day, which I've been do, doing for ten, 10 years. Not a lot happens. You know, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot of this. <laughs> in terms of retrofitting, how much is the planning issue? Um, we're doing all right with that. I mean, we, we, I would say depend, we develop pretty quickly good conversations with local authorities. And uh, Wilden have been brilliant. We, I mean, there's uh, projects we're doing in Wilden at the moment which are amazing. And we've got, you, get, you speak to the right people in Wilden, and mm. you, so in some parts of Wilden we have to talk to other people who are a lot more difficult. But which leads us straight into Abby, who, say, who is from Wilden. Having up next. Sorry? No, you're right. I mean, you are totally right. I mean, I, I'm um, at the moment nearly probably a month away from being a code assessor. So when I looked at that, your house is code four. Um, councils are going that way anyway because in Crawley they've just built I think about 21, 22 properties and they're all code 4, so the lower carbon, obviously what they're put in, putting in them and um, they're getting the, um, the, the payback back out of that by actually investing in housing that obviously suits to this day and age. So yeah, anything like what you're doing is welcomed in Wielden because obviously um, it's the way forward, you, you know, toe the line sort of thing we could say, but it's actually the way forward. Existing stock, obviously, there's a bit of a dilemma there, but that will be coming next year on certain ways we can get funding to do solid stone, solid solid wall properties. But <coughs> for building going forward, it's all going to be cut for sustainable um, levels. Level four is excellent to achieve because at the moment it's like level three, but level four is really good. One thing I just wanted to leave you with, actually, because there's a lot of old properties in Forest Road, and um, we're just doing a Victorian villa, another one, we're not doing it when we did the Nook in Brighton, um, and we're not having to insulate the walls. There's a SPAB, which is the Society for the Preservation of Ancient Buildings, have got recent research that proves that these old buildings actually perform a bit better than you might think, and actually you might think of uh, curtains or um, shutters before you think of double glazing, that sort of thing. It's really good research, and we applied that research, which had really good you know, figures associated with it, good uh, proper empirical research. And we found out that this big Victorian house, a bit like that, didn't have to have its 320 mil thick walls insulated. Got loads of insulation in the roof and the ground, and uh, we were able to get away with not insulating the walls. And so these th this thing's all moving on very quickly now, which means it's very so, exciting. So what do you make of, uh, I mean, I've had a conversation with a, an architectural assistant in, in Bath, in terms of conservation, Rules, and he was telling me that uh, in Bath, that that they're not even allowing people to put secondary glazing into uh, uh, the conservation yeah. frontage because of all how it how it alters the appearance of the glazing because of the reflection or something yeah. like that, and that seems to me absolutely crazy. But it, it is. But in terms of national housing stock, I mean, or building stock, only about five percent of our buildings are listed. Right. And I think what we need is local authorities to sort of join together and have a strategic approach because we can't sort it out all, all by ourselves. And for example, Lewis High Street perhaps is a way of doing it differently to do what is the majority of our housing stock, which is post-war. Mm. So get the post-war stuff working hard for you and maybe the beautiful stuff that we all treasure. We don't, all, I think it's dumb to say everything's got to reduce carbon emissions by 80%. I think there are some new build things that could be zero carbon or negative and, uh, you yeah, know, the Royal Crescent in Bath, you leave it alone, you know, it's gorgeous and, you know, there's a, there's a renewable energy system that supports it. So, so. Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah.